So good morning. Good morning, Ellen. Good morning, Melanie. Good morning, Anne. So I do have to give a shout out to my colleagues, uh, Ellen, Melanie, and Anne, because without them, I'm going to tear up, but I never tear up. Without them, none of this would be possible. So it's been a long road, but I feel like I have colleagues I can trust. After 12 years, I gave up some very beloved departments, and I did that knowing that the projects that I handed over and all of those contacts would be well taken care of. So that was really hard for me. So I'm here today to talk to you about uh, patents and quirky patent coloring books and how this all came about. And I do feel like the last man standing because I was on the original planning committee with the UMass Five and no one is here but me. <laughs> so, but then I remember Carolyn soon came on and things like that and Valerie. So uh, it's interesting to be the last person standing. So interesting. And so in part of that, every year when we did evaluations, people consistently said that they wanted some type of hands-on uh, workshop for the capstone, things like that. And logistically, it was really kind of difficult to think of how to doing that. I know Carolyn did a great job last year evaluating journals, right, at, at Brandeis, and so that was a hands-on workshop. And so today, uh, our schedule is going to be that I'm going to take about an hour, maybe probably a little bit less, to teach you a little bit about patent so that you can, and patent searching so that you can get up to speed in doing some patent searching. And then we will take a break. And then we will come back for maybe five minutes, and I'll recap just to get you back in the mode of this is how you're going to do some patent searching. And we are going to pull together some really great quirky patents that have to do with science, boots, or camping. And we'll make a uh, patent coloring book. And so I do have a consent form on the Google folder thing where you're, I'm going to ask for your consent because then it'll be up on my scholar works page and you can put it up on your selected works page or whatever you want to do. So here we go. So I became the patent and trademark resource librarian by chance. So one morning I met with my uh, supervisor's boss and I thought, oh gee, what, what have I done now? And uh, during that meeting, she asked me if I wanted to be the Patent and Trademark Resource Center librarian. And I said, sure, I'd, I'd love to do that. And so I went back to my desk and I Googled Patent and Trademark <laughs> Resource Center, <laughs> right? Because that's how it usually happens. Usually, you know, I'm the type of person that I dream big and I do big projects and I like things that are messy and complicated and things that I'm not good at, especially draw me. To them. So I said yes. And this is, I just wanted to show a picture of this. This is in my library. I've kind of am good at commandeering spaces that people don't use and uh, turn them into something. I guess that's the 20 year high school teacher in me that I, in my classroom, I always had like a little craft area, a discovery area, uh, like the little school supply area. So I like these little areas in libraries where people can just kind of find information about something. And I hope Ellen puts together a health sciences area. So, so yeah, so I just pulled this together, low cost, material sent to me for free, bulletin board displays, things like that. So I encourage you, if you are passionate about something, just try to find a space in your library where you can share that passion. So I became the Patent and Trademark Resource Center librarian. And if you don't know, this is a collection of about 80 uh, centers in the country. About half of them are academic libraries. Half of them are public libraries. There are a few state libraries. And then there is one very special library. Anyone know what that very special library is? The special one in, on the Missouri border. What's that place, Anne, that has all those standards? Linda Hall Library, right. All those standards that they don't loan, 
Right. So these are Patent and Trademark Resource Centers. It was a program developed by the United States Patent and Trademark Office way back when to help people uh, access patents because people were patenting things. They were in paper and they needed to see if something was patented before. And now they've turned into places where just librarians uh, help I always say regular people. So we help regular people. I don't help faculty. I don't help graduate students. When they come to me and they say, I have an idea, I said, that, oh, that's great. Is it part of any sponsored research? If it's part of sponsored research, then I say, you need to go see the tech transfer office. And sometimes they come back because they want to learn how to patent search and things like that. So we help regular people, and it's usually a bunch of uh, sometimes strange people, right? <laughs> so everyone's got an idea, everyone wants to make a million bucks. I, uh, sometimes they call me dream buster because really there are 10 million patents. You don't think someone has thought of that before? So uh, who knows? So it came to be that in 2016, the National uh, Archives made a patent coloring book. Did any of you see that? Yeah, take a moment right now if you're on your computer to Google that, National Archives Patent Coloring Book. I don't have a slide of that. But when you find that, you'll see that it's just full of really weird, quirky things. Did you find it? Yeah, open it up. Just got some really, oh, I see, what do you look like? You've got this like, what, what, right? Look at those things, they're really kind of weird. Who wouldn't love those? They're quirky, someone thought of them. And so when that came out in 2016, I thought, wow, that's really kind of a great outreach, outreach thing. I'm gonna do that, and so I started with some a coloring book. I think it was, uh, gosh, it was Spooky Patents. So I have a bunch of those back there. They're on my selected works page. They're downloadable. Uh, it's fascinating to see who downloads them. The people in South Korea, interestingly enough, love patent coloring books. So I started with Spooky Patents. I just pulled together a few. Then it was Thanksgiving, Let's Talk Turkey Patents. And somehow I got into this really weird title naming thing that it had to be like a, a strange thing. So I'm on now, I finished one last week called Zen and the Art of Sandpaper Patents. I haven't put it up yet because I don't know about you, but at the end of the academic year, all my mind can handle is maybe coloring a piece of sandpaper, right? So I came to do this really as an outreach effort. I, I'm involved with my public libraries. I send them them. Uh, I take them in print form places where I go. Uh, I put bulletin board displays up about them. And it's just a way to engage regular people with patents. So how many of you have done any patent searching, know about patents? How many, anyone know someone who has a patent? right, in universities, right? Or maybe a grandfather, grandmother, whatever, right? So it's a really strange world, and I kind of fell into it, and I hope that you love it as much as I do. So now on to the learning part. So there are three types of patents, and they started way back when in 1790, and I always forget the dates, so I tell myself a story. So 1790 in the US, I think what was happening at that time, I think it was kind of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution coming over from Britain, and especially in this part of the country, it was a lot of textiles. So patenting started way back then in 1790. It's utility patents are the main type of patents. They are 95% of all patents issued. Uh, up at this point, we're over number 10 million. So, and there are things that do something, right? So it's like a machine, a process. There we have uh, the iPod, which was a revolutionary patent. And the conditions are it needs to be novel, useful, and not obvious. And those things to me seem completely subjective. 
But utility patents have taken a turn because now you can have software patents. So that to me is really kind of strange because I think why can I have a patent on a set of code but I can't have a copyright on a recipe? Because to me those are the same type of thing. They're instructions. So I think there's some might be some gender bias in who gets protection for certain things. Uh, there are also GMO patents. Those are utility patents. So, uh, and that happened because of, all these changes happened because of court cases. So I do work a lot with my government documents librarian and our copyright and law policy librarian to teach me things about how court cases change patenting. So utility patents, 95% started in 1790. Design patents, I think to myself, well, once the Industrial Revolution got going and there was competition, maybe you wanted to distinguish your item from something else. So in 1842, we started with design patents. So today when we do our patent coloring book, if you choose to do the category of boots, you will be looking at a lot of design patents. So they don't change the functionality, they just change the way something looks. And design patents often overlap with trademarking. So we continue on, and they're about 4% of all the patents. So then we continue on to my favorite, which are plant patents. So these are things that are asexually reproduced. And I'm so glad that we got Melanie, because every once in a while, I will ask her question at lunch and say, I think the last one I asked you is, what is a phage, right? Because I had heard something like, and so she can teach me all about biology, because that is not my, in my wheelhouse. So plant patents started in, uh, I would, if I think of the history of this country, I think of the Dust Bowl and uh, agriculture, all of those issues that happened, and plant patents started in 1931, around the, in the middle of the Dust Bowl, the Depression, getting people to grow their own food, all of that type of stuff, and they're for things that are asexually reproduced. And so at UMass Amherst, we have a very large collection of plant patents. We get, I get a packet every week, they come in paper because the color that you see on a screen might be different than the color you see on your laptop. And so people who were growers, gardeners, care about the color and they want to be able to see, so we get them in paper form, right? And I do have to say, I started a seed library for one purpose only and that was to draw people in eventually to look at plant patents. So seeds, plants, maybe they'll get some connection. Okay, any questions on the three types of patents? So plant patents, they're less than 1%, right? And uh, interestingly about plant patents, uh, they are mostly uh, the people patenting or applying for patents are from the Netherlands. Uh, there are very few uh, plant patents issued to companies in the US. So it's mostly foreigners doing that type of patenting. Maybe you think of, when you think of the Netherlands, you think of bulbs and tulips and things like that. So, yep. Where what? Drag, oh, so they are utility patents, right? So they do something. And, oh, sorry. So where do uh, drug patents fall in? So they are utility patents, yep. And uh, there's now, you know, uh, what happens is, I think oh, you all know, uh, a patent is issued for about 20 years, and then it goes off patent, and then someone else makes the drug, and you are able to purchase it as a generic, right? But it's interesting in pharmaceuticals and drug patents, there's this whole phenomenon called uh, evergreening, where uh, a company will say like, oh, you know, we, had, we patented this for this particular claim, but now we're finding that it also does this. We want to extend the life of the patent for that. And should that be allowed? I don't know, right? But it is really big money. Right? So as you search today, you'll see that patents used to be very modest in length, 
one page, two pages, things like that. So now I think the longest patent that we have is over 3,000 pages. It's a pharmaceutical patent. And so when I think about that, and I think about the fact that a patent attorney, patent lawyer, whatever, costs about $600 an hour, I think of the cost to put together that, uh, that patent, right? Interesting. Okay, so now we'll get into searching. So searching can be a thorny process, but you're all librarians, you're gonna be good at this. So I just help regular old people, so I always think to myself, if I can teach a 15-year-old boy about the mole, I can teach anyone about patent searching. So here we go. It sometimes does involve a variety of formats. So things have been digitized, but that's not always perfect as you'll see today. And so sometimes you do have to go back to CDs, microform, things like that. So we used to get these old, Barbara will remember the old Cassis CDs, things like that. So there is some information that you can only find on those old things. But as librarians, we're used to all those formats. The history of publishing, that's in our wheelhouse. So in searching, there are a number of different ways you search. And as librarians, you know that keyword searching is the way that pe most people love to search. But for patents, it's not very good. So we'll talk about how, you know, balloon, balloon, you know, if I was in 1840, I would think one thing, but now I think another thing. So, you know, uh, the meaning of things changes. And for example, today, if you are searching for the boots for boot camp, you'll be searching in a class, uh, the category that is habdashery. When was the last time you used the word habdashery, right? So keyword searching is the way people always want to do it first. That's okay. And then there's inventor searching. So you might know someone who has a patent, right? And you want to find them. There is absolutely no name authority. So did they use their middle initial? Did they transgender? Did they get married and change their name? Whatever. Like, it's, it's a mess. And at one point, I believe, and Barbara, correct me if I'm wrong, the USPTO was looking into using ORCID numbers, but I don't think they went through with that. So inventor searching is not always so easy. And then there's assignee searching. So the inventor is the actual person who invented it. The assignee is, I think, of the company, right? Who you worked for. You work for a university, you work for 3M, you work for Dow, you are handing over your intellectual property rights. Those are the people who own it. But as we all know, companies change their name. They all, you know, can glob, uh, pull together, it seems. And so searching that can sometimes be difficult, the assignee name. So for example, when I did the the Star Wars patent coloring book. It was diff difficult because was it Lucas, Lucas Films, Lucas Films Incorporated? So there were some issues in trying to find the assignee. So that's interesting. And then we get to, as librarians, what I hope you're going to come to embrace, which is classification searching. So this bottom page is a uh, all the classes in the United States patent classification system. So a while ago now, in 2013, we switched from the United States patent classification system to the cooperative patent classification system, CPC. So if you have a computer, why don't you right now take a moment to either Google uh, United States patent classification or cooperative patent classification. So you know, as, and I'll just speak as you're going, as patenting ha happened, right? So after they had a number of things, they thought, well, I need to put like with like, and they started to make buckets, classifications of how to organize things. So all the washing machines are together, all the cotton gins are together in the class, things like that and it kind of just happened haphazardly, right? Kind of how things happen. 
and uh, they made different classification systems. The cooperative patent classification system is really kind of different because it only has, I believe, 11 different main classes. So did you find, did you look at CPC or USPC, right? It's just like, you know, it's just gonna be like we're used to in the Library of Congress, right? So in the Library of Congress, we catalog things, we put buckets of things together. There are some questions about where things should go. And that's what the United States Path Patent Classification and System is like, okay? You're just gonna put like would like, okay? But it was a big change, as I'll go back, when we went to CPC that it really was a whole different system. And uh, it's, it's just much different. You should know it probably takes about 36 months for a patent to be issued from when you file to when it gets granted. So this whole process of changing over from USPC to CPC has taken a bit of time. So it's not like a drop dead date of after January 1st, everything was classified to CPC. There's, you know, most patents still have both. So you'll find both classes. And so that's made searching difficult because now I have to teach people different search systems. Okay, so, but you're gonna be okay with this because you understand Library of Congress classification system. So put this all together. And so when I meet with generally a 65 year old man who has something in a brown bag that he doesn't want to show me and doesn't want to tell me, Rachel is nodding her head, right? I can't tell you, I can't show you, but I want your help, right? Uh, I have to teach them a number of things. And, uh, and so just like in the reference interview, I asked some questions. How authoritative do you want it to be? How much time do you want to spend on this? You know, what's your expertise with search systems? I've had people who have come in and don't want to touch, touch a keyboard, right? So that's when I hand them a pencil and say, can you, can you touch the pencil? And then the pencil can touch the keyboard. Because I'm really, as a Patent and Trademark Resource Center uh, librarians, we are not allowed to search for people. We're not allowed to fill out the applications for them. We teach them how to fish. So I, I'm gonna teach you how to fish today. And then uh, I have to do have to tell them, give them some knowledge about the US patent classification system and hope that they take those words of advice and do that type of searching. So usually when someone comes in, I spend a good hour, hour and a half, two hours with them to teach them how to do this. And uh, I know that sometimes I can be kind of dismissive and kind of quirky and maybe not so nice. But when I meet a patent person, I am all about respecting them and their dignity and their invention. So I get really kind of choked up about that. So today, and with these people, I always teach them four different ways to search. So we're gonna spend a few minutes with each of these, and my favorite is Google Patents. Did any of you know that there's a Google Patents site? Excellent. Just a few weeks ago, Rachel and I went to the Patent Information Users Group Conference where Rachel got a scholarship to go. And uh, we were told by Barbara to go to that conference. And uh, the people from Google Patents were there. And when I met them, I thought, oh my gosh, they must have a whole team of people to keep this Google Patent thing going. It's three young guys, right? Ian and I forget who the other guys were and they, they were amazing. Google Patents has really kind of revolutionized patent searching for the regular person. So before when someone came and said like, you know, uh, my great aunt invented some sewing, whatever, uh, if I had to go to the United States Patent Class, you know, the USPTO site, it was a nightmare. And now Google Patents, you just type it in, you find it, stuff like that. Google Patents searches everything. And there's actually, Anne showed me there, there's a little space where you can see how many uh, patents from each country it has and 
down below at the very right bottom of the part. And so uh, that's really interesting. You can see who the assignees are. You can see the CPC classes, stuff like that. Okay, let's go over. And the other one I'd like you to look at now is the USPTO website. So just Google USPTO.gov. I should let you know that the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, is a 100% fee-based agency. They get no money from the federal government. Uh, they have a lot of examiners. It's a great job for people who are engineers and scientists, things like that. Uh, but it's a burnout job because it is like a factory line. It's like production. They have to examine so many patents a month, so many patents a quarter, applications, and uh, it's really burnout. So people usually stay for a few years and then go. They do get paid very well, but it's not easy work. There are actually three different search buckets, I'll say, in the USPTO. There are uh, newer patents uh, since 1976. There are patents before 1976. And then there are applications. So the applications are in a whole different bucket. So I always tell people, before you put your money on the table for your patent application, you want to see if there are any applications in the queue. Because again, remember, it takes about three months from when you put the application in to when it gets granted. So there's like three years of applications in the queue that you might need to search. So the USPTO website is horrible, right? Repeat after me. The USPTO does not care about me, right? We have gone, Rachel, Sarah, myself, have gone to many a, uh, a training at the USPTO, and we ask about search systems, and they always give the same answer. Well, that's a legacy system. We're not going to put any, any money into that, OK? So uh, they only look forward. They don't look backwards. And uh, I don't think they really understand. You know, if you want to make patenting part of this culture, right? Because now we think of, you know, Apple patents and Sony patents and 3,000 page patents and it's big money. If you want to really include regular people, you better have a search system that is inviting and friendly to them. And I don't find this particular, uh, this search system very inviting or friendly. The one good thing about the USPTO website is they always tell you when it gets updated. It usually gets updated every Thursday. Right? So one of my favorite uh, outreach presentations to do is to go to a senior center and to pull out all the patents from that town over time and talk with seniors about, did you know? Did you know this person, right? And that's kind of a nice thing for seniors. I do go here to the USPTO. So I put like either inventor city or assignee city, right? So all from a town, right? You'll be searching from 1976 to the present or you can drop down and do pre-1976, from 1790 to 1976. Let's move on. What we're going to be looking at is the index to the United States Patent Classification, USPC. So this is the, I call it the translator when I work with patrons. This is the translator between words and classification. So let's all think of a, a word. An umbrella. Let's go to you. Does it give number slash number, right? So that is the classification for that particular class, umbrellas. So all the umbrellas are under that class and subclass. And let's go to one last one, and then we'll continue on. We're going to Google the name ESPOSNet or eSpaceNet. This one up here. So that is the European 
database of patents. So the USPTO, we're dealing with 10 million patents. If we go to a SPOSNET, we have over 100 million patents, right? And there are a number of different ways you can search at a SPOSNET. They have this little smart search, so you can put your words in a box, right? And it does a smart search. Or sometimes I teach people to do this classification search over there. So, and you'll see it's just, you get lists and, you know, it's just like any search system. You learn how it works and then they change it and then you adapt, right? Just like anything. So these are the four search systems that I use all the time with people. Sometimes they get overloaded, you know, and that, then there are other search systems you can use. So when I was at PIUG, I learned about searching Japan, uh, Chinese patents and Korean patents. So now I'm going to work with my Asian studies librarian to make a patent coloring book with her because I can't understand those systems, the language. So reaching out to other people to do that. Okay, all of this is good, except you need to know that there is a big divide in the patent world, and that is pre-1976. So pre-1976 is about four million patents. Four million of the patents, of the 10 million, you can only find by issue date. So maybe you'd like to look up Oh, maybe you want to make a coloring book of all the patents issued on your birthday. Okay, that's how you would access that, by issue date, right? By patent number. Maybe you have a favorite number that you play in the lottery all the time, and you want to see what that patent, what that translates to a patent. You could find that through patent number. And by current U.S. classification. So when I tell the 65-year-old man with his brown paper bag, with his thing that you can only find pre-1976 patents that way, they always say the same thing, which I do find fascinating. If I knew the patent number, why I wouldn't need to search then. Like, it's, it's not very intuitive that those are the only ways that you can find those older patents. So that's when I have to teach them about the classification system. So that is a big divide that we're going to be dealing with today. Okay? Okay, so along the way, I have some road maps. But I always give people, and these are two ways of seeing the same data. Uh, the first one, the colored one, is made by a very famous patent uh, PTRC librarian, uh, Michael White. So he made a lot of these handouts that people use. He's now up in Canada at Queen's University, but when he was involved in the Patent and Trademark Resource Center, he became a legend. So this is a guide to year and patent number. So when you're searching and you see a patent number, you have a quick guide as to what year was that patent. And then the other thing that I always give people is a classification guide. So when you're looking at a bunch of patents and you see a bunch of numbers, you know, what, what, what was that? Was it a bed frame? Was it a washing machine? Is it a toy soldier, right? So these uh, classification guides, okay? You should never underestimate the time, the amount of time it's going to take you. So this, when I made the, if anyone has the creatures of Star Wars, anyone have that coloring book with them? That was the absolute hardest patent coloring book to make because when you look at the title, they all have the exact same title. Toy figure, toy figure, toy figure. So I sat there for days clicking on many toy figures to find these patents, right? And so today, together, what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a patent coloring book, all things science, boots, and camping.
And so the way I usually do it, I'll go back and show you, is I usually put uh, the, the patent number, right? And these are all, if you see a D or a DES in front of a patent number, that is a design patent, right? If it's a plant patent, which I don't think you'll see any today, they have a PP. So plant patent, design patent with D or DES, and then utility patents just have the plain old number. So in when I make a coloring book, and I guess I'm asking for what you want to do as a group, I usually put the patent number, right? I usually put the title of the patent. In this case, there, it's not very exciting, right? I usually put, oh, it didn't come out very good on here. I usually put the issue date. And then for today, what I'd like to do with your consent, and I have a consent form, I'd like to put a column that says contributed by, that you are the person that found that patent. And I'll write a little preamble that we can all edit in a Google folder about uh, you know this exercise and all things science, boots, things like that, so that people will know what we did. Okay? So we are going to divvy you up. What's your interest? Are you a science person? Are you a boot person? Or are you a camping person? The design people, that's going to be a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, the boot people, that's going to be a lot of design patents. Okay, science is going to, science I think is going to be the difficult one. And what we're really going to want to go for are patents that are quirky. So what is the definition of quirky, right? When Rachel and I were at the PIUG, someone did a, uh, a presentation of a guy from IBM, an engineer, who talked about using artificial intelligence to find patents. And I had a long conversation with him about could we train a computer to look through 10 million patents to pull out the things that were quirky. And he did not think that that could be done. But then I said to him, my credit card. I have a credit card history, right? And every once in a while, I will get a notice of they think that something has been fraudulent. So I said to him, it seems to me that you can train something, right? And then when something doesn't fit that algorithm, it boots it out as quirky, just like when I do a credit card purchase that doesn't seem to fit my normal pattern, right? So today we're gonna to try to find things that are quirky. Okay, and we're gonna do this by using these two different ones, Google Patents and the USPC Index. So let's just go through what you're gonna do for each one. So in Google Patents, so easy to use, right? You're gonna go into Google Patents and you're gonna put in some type of something, either with boots, with science, or with camping. Google Patents is great, who doesn't love that? And when I put in camping lantern, I get something that looks like this. Oh, it doesn't look too good up there, but you get something, right? And the biggest thing is, I would like it if we could limit this patent coloring book to just US patents, right? So the way you do that in Google Patents, I just pressed, you know, I put in Camping Lantern, and I get some type of result list. So if you go over here, over here, they kind of hide it, you want to limit Patent Office US. And then you have a choice you can limit it to either patent or design. So patent or design. So design is just gonna give you design patents. Patent, which I don't think is a very good term they should put there, I would put utility. Utility patents or design patents, right? And if you click on one of the pictures, does it kind of blow it up, right? So you get to see the picture. This is revolutionary because when I take you to the USPTO site, you're gonna see, it takes a lot of work to see the picture. 
We just want to look at the picture. And do not read the patents. <laughs> we just care about the pictures. This is a coloring book, not an information book. Okay? We want to find quirky pictures, things that are strange about boots, camping, and science. So when you click on the pictures, they kind of get expanded. And maybe you want to click on one of the actual patents. So now I have clicked on one of the patents for one of the lanterns. And to actually see the whole patent, you're going to download the PDF. But maybe you don't need to do that because it wasn't a picture of something that you liked. Right? Something that the Google people, the magic Google people, just added, and they told us about a few weeks ago at this conference, was they put this similar feature. Find me all the patents that are similar to that patent. And I am fascinated to know the algorithm of how they did that because, boy, you get some weird stuff. <laughs> I do not know how they did that. But that's their magic, and they never, they never tell. So you should know that these Google people, the three guys, Ian and I don't know the other guy, two guys' names, but I send them stuff all the time. On the very front of the Google site, there is a feedback form, and they have responded to every single thing I have sent. I usually send them a snapshot and say like, WTF, why did that happen? And they respond back. It's kind of nice. Okay, so you are going to use Google Patents. So up here, you also want to put, I want to see the old stuff. Because I do find that the older patents have the best images. We are just interested in the images. So we're going to limit to US, maybe design or utility patents. We're going to do the oldest. And then you can find some good images, and then maybe use the similar feature. It'll take you a while to get it down. But basically, this is the process that we're going to do. So on one side of your handout are the steps for Google Patents, right? So Google Patents, put in a search term, limit it to US, maybe just patent or design. I want to look at the oldest things. And maybe I'm just going to look at the images, the similar feature. When you find something weird that you want to save, you want to download it to your desktop. Don't worry about what you're naming it at this point. Maybe just name it something so that you can remember it. But eventually what's going to happen is you are each going to be responsible for finding one good, quirky image in your category. And then I'll ask you to name it using this naming convention, right? The patent number, the title with a space in between, and then your first initial and your last name. And then we'll up, you'll upload that to a shared Google folder that you each got an invitation to. There is not a way to sort just for patents that have images, right? So that's Google Patents. Then I'm also going to teach you, and you're also going to do the USPC way. So you can, again, Google index to USPC. You're going to go into the USPC index. You're going to find that word. Like I went to camp and camping. I went to cook stoves. That was the class and subclass. I clicked on that. It took me to a page. And this is, believe me, this is not easy. It took me to a page where I then had to find that class and subclass in a page in which the numbers are not in order. And this is the magic part that no one ever tells you. Because repeat after me, the USPTO does not care about me. That little P, 
which they will never tell you, will give you all the patents in that class and subclass. The little a will give you all the applications in that class and subclass. Why would you not tell me that? Because the USPTO does not care about me. Right, so that's why I made the big P there. You're gonna, that's how you find all the patents in that class and subclass. And then it begins the game of click, click, click. So you click on one of these. First, I usually go to the end. Look at this class had 1,500 patents. I want the old stuff, the weird stuff that's at the end of the list. So I navigate my way to the end of the list by jumping there. I get the things that look like this, and you are gonna have to click and click and click, because you click on that patent, you click on that number, and you're gonna, you get to a page, and you have to go to images to actually see the image. If you like that image and you want to save that patent, you might want to see all the pages of that patent. So over here it says full pages. And if you like that patent, you will download it. This is a lot of clicking. You click forwards and then you click backwards. And then you go back to your list, right? And you do it again. Forwards and backwards. Forwards and backwards. Wow, who would ever use this over Google, right? So if you want something new, I would use Google, right? So I do want you to try to use both systems. So this one, the USPTO is not easy, but it is authoritative. So I always tell people, before you put your money on the table, right? Are you gonna trust the Google people? I don't know. And then I have the people who say, the Google people are tracking me. They know what I'm doing. They're gonna file that patent before I do. And I always say, yeah, but I'm going to go home first and file that patent, right? So again, these are the instructions. It's not gonna be easy, right? But I do want you to have a chance to do both. Think about if you wanna be a science person, a boot person, or a camping person, and then we have a good hour for you to find one weird patent that you want attributed to you for the patent coloring book. I will clean up the images. Uh, we'll make a note about that. So I'll write like a little preamble and patent number contributed by your name, all that little stuff, and we'll put that together. You'll all have access to that. I think we won't put duplicates in because I imagine there might be some duplicates in. It'll be a really big coloring book, but then you can do with it as you want, right? So science, boot, and camp. I do, you know, I do invite you to use this exercise maybe with engineering classes or with a science, you know, some type of instruction class that you do to, you know, faculty are always getting patents, so maybe keep an eye on that. What I do is uh, when I learn of a faculty patent, I write them a little note, and on my note card is the picture of the Koopa corn, and I says something like, congratulations on your patent. I hope it's as good as the Koopa corn, <laughs> right? Because they've probably spent thousands of hours, right? Thousands of dollars and, you know, and there's the Koopa corn. So that kind of makes light of it, but also it starts the conversation. And that's what I hope that you do is you start the conversation, maybe by making posters, maybe not full-size posters, but gosh, you can just print these out tabloid on a printer Right, you can, you can uh, make a display somewhere, you can laminate them so they're more, you know, I don't know, whatever. So write some faculty notes to your people who get patents, maybe make some posters. Seriously, think about making a celebration patent coloring book. So uh, I know at my university we've talked about uh, poinsettia patents and maybe making the Christmas card or the holiday card, excuse me, from our university be some type of uh, patent, 
right? So, and I do say, like, if, you, if using the search systems is difficult, and I understand that, you can just use plain old Google and just Google, you know, I don't know, coffee pot patents. And if you look at images, they will all come up. So one of the last things I want to talk about is that patent information uh, has no demographic information. So it's very hard to pull together, for example, uh, Hispanic patents by people who are Hispanic or patents by people who were children or who were immigrants, things like that. So that is very difficult to track and it's incredibly time consuming. So just to let you know, the way I usually start is I usually start with a theme, right? And I usually try to brainstorm words around that theme and then I start looking stuff up and each of these usually takes me a few hours, right? And I always have a lot more then what goes in the coloring book, I usually try to limit it to just a few pages. And just so you know, when you print it out, you probably want to print it out. I always print out the cover sheet so it's two-sided, but then all the coloring pages one-sided so that when you color, you're not coloring on the back side of something. Right? So I hope you take the time to do that. And remember, the USPTO doesn't care about you but you should care about patents because it really is what drives the innovation of this country forward and really educating our students, fellow librarians, things like that about patents, patent literature, all that stuff is a great way to engage with science.